Hey. It's 420 somewhere, and right now that somewhere is right here. So hello and welcome to the Cannabis Show. I'm producer Vince, and here's your host, Ricardo Baca. Vince, dude, thank you, man. How's it going? And to everybody joining us today, welcome to the Cannabis Show, where we talk about all things weed. That's all things. And that's the serious marijuana coverage, but also the not-so-serious reviews, videos, and everything else. Uh, in fact, if you pop onto the site right now, that is thecannabis.co. You will see stories about a vape party at the Winter X Games getting canceled. Half pipe salon. About Arsenio Hall almost narking on his Uber driver. Seriously, don't smoke and drive. And about a military style marijuana raid in Colorado that is now the subject of a lawsuit. Cops do love their tanks. <laughs> of course, <laughs> producer Vince is here in the studio with me, dude. Have you been? I have been <laughs> wonderful, Ricardo. Thank you so much for asking. I have a very exciting week coming up in two weeks with the Broncos going off to the Super Bowl, and it looks like DPTV is headed out there. How have you been, Ricardo? I know. <laughs> Super Bowl 50. Very exciting. I'm good, man. I'm psyched about the Broncos. I'm very nervous about the Panthers, um, and I don't think I'm alone. But, Vince, <laughs> it's time for the week in weed. You ready for this? I'll pull a little Homer thing and say, as long as we're not starting in Carolina, I'm good, dude. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We are starting this week in weed in Kansas, of all places, where the state's Supreme Court recently struck down a voter-approved ordinance in Wichita that would have reduced penalties for possessing small amounts of marijuana. Now, this story goes back to April of 2015, when voters in Kansas's largest city said yes to the ordinance, which would have imposed a fine of no more than $50 for someone 21 or older convicted for the first time of possessing 32 grams or less of marijuana. Yeah, Ricardo, and much like my student loans, those numbers have been going up and up. What would have been a $50 fine under that ordinance now costs offenders $2,500 and up to a year in jail. There's a wee bit of a difference there, dude. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, and voters and city officials in Wichita saw this coming. The state's attorney general warned the city before last year's election that the ordinance was in conflict with state law and said it couldn't be enforced. As soon as 54% of Wichita residents said yes to the ordinance, the state filed a lawsuit, and the state Supreme Court agreed with the AG's office. Of course they did. In its decision, Kansas's highest court simply said that the ordinance wasn't enacted according to state law. Wichita's response was just as simple, saying that the court's decision provided clarity for all cities receiving such petitions. I know, you know, interesting things happen. And Kansas is, what, it's 100, 150 miles from here? Next door. So it's an entirely different world. Now, elsewhere in the Week in Weed events, a group based not too far from our studio here in Denver is looking to revive a social pot use ballot effort that other activists dropped last summer. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, new chapter in Denver, said recently that they hope to push a social use initiative initiative in November's vote, and it will resemble a similar one pushed by activists last year. Yeah, and everyone, if you were watching or listening to the show last summer and last fall, you'll remember the previous social use initiative, which took a more liberal position than most of the public consumption proposals that we've seen. Yeah, I know. Last year's initiative was pushed by activists with the Marijuana Policy Project and law firm Vicente Cedarberg, and they wanted to put the decision of allowing or not allowing some kind of cannabis consumption to the owners of these businesses, you know, be it a bar, theater, art gallery. Uh, but most initiatives designate a specific licensed establishment that can offer on-site consumption, not unlike uh, Toronto's vape lounges where alcohol is not sold. Uh, but last year's initiative was pulled in September after the organizers said they hoped to work with the city and state regulators and businesses instead, and it's not yet clear what kind of initiative will be drafted by Denver Normal. It is interesting to see Normal involved in this conversation, though, 
because wasn't it Normal's founder who said it was, quote, embarrassing when the activists pulled their initiative off the ballot last year? It was, and the timing couldn't be better given that our first guest on the show today was one of those activists, activists. who drafted and then pulled the social use initiative last year. It is my pleasure to welcome Mason Tavert of the Marijuana Policy Project back to the Cannabis Show. Hey, Mason. Thank you for having me. Hey, good to see you again, dude. See you as well. How's everything been? Oh, things are good. Ah, good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, so good. much to talk about today. First, we're starting out sativa or indica, Mason. Oh, uh, you know, uh, generally, if I am going to consume, I would probably lean on the more indica side. Indica side. All yeah. right. Any reason in particular? Uh, you know, sativa is generally a little speedy, and yeah. it's not really, if I find the time to, to use marijuana, it's not because I want to think and worry faster than I do already. It's to relax, so. Relax and get away. All right, well, Mason, as you heard, we were just talking about uh, this Denver Normal attempt to revive an initiative that you were a part of last year. Um, what, do you th what do you think about this new push to hopefully push uh, social use in spaces? Uh, you know, we haven't seen any sort of language, and uh, I'm not really familiar with the folks who have brought it forward. Uh, I'm certainly familiar with Normal, but have not, have sure. not talked with them. Uh, but we are still working and talking with city officials and we are still contemplating a, a citywide initiative as well. Uh, as we've said from the beginning, that right. if the city officials didn't follow through, then we would move forward with something. So, you know, we're still still working on this and we're also watching what's going on in the legislature because that's also gonna play a role in this. Uh, the legislature is considering taking some sort of action at the state level that could very well impact the local level. But really, you know, we know that Denver can do this and uh, we had city officials and business leaders make promises that they would work with us on this and we're gonna hold them to it. And if they don't, then uh, we, we plan to move forward with the yeah. initiative. Well, tell me, I'm curious, uh, do you have a good feeling going in? I mean, obviously a new legislative season just began. Um, do you have a good feeling that something is going to come of this, hey, let's work together model? Uh, you know, we are, are open to working with anyone and everyone, uh, and that's why we're, we're, in addition to working with, with, with activists and, and organizations, we're really trying to work with the broader Denver business community, the hotel and the hotel association, the restaurant right. association, uh, the mayor's office, the council. And so far, uh, we've had some productive conversations, but we also still see some hangups, uh, particularly you know when it comes to folks like it, it, with the mayor's office. Uh, but we will see how things work out. And you, know, you got to really keep in mind that uh, when we were looking at this last time around, it was a situation where we had our mayor's office and city attorney's office saying, if this passes, it'll violate state law, and we won't allow it. And while that may or may not be true we would say it's not true sure. um, we do have experience running local initiatives that city officials in denver have refused to implement such as the initiatives in 2005 and 7. so the opportunity to work with city officials and actually do something that will get implemented is is intriguing intriguing i like it all right well let's uh, expand our scope um, because of course we've talked plenty about the five or six states that are going to be voting on recreational marijuana this november but what I think is way more interesting are the states that are considering legalization, legalization legislatively, which is kind of a tongue twister in and of itself. <laughs> legalization legislatively. Uh, can, can you talk about these states, Mason? Sure. Well, there's two in particular this year that are very exciting, and those are Vermont and Rhode Island. And these are both states right. where uh, we fully believe that they could adopt laws legalizing and regulating marijuana for adult use this year. And to be clear, what, 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 how does that work? Because in Vermont, they don't have voter-approved ballot initiatives at a Correct. state level, right? Correct. There's no initiative process in Vermont or Rhode Island, so those have to happen through the legislature. And in Vermont, uh, we're very fortunate to have a supportive governor there, Governor Shumlin. Uh, Pete Shumlin has been very outspoken on this issue for years, and uh, was just in the news again today saying that he's... Yeah. Uh, fully supportive of something that as long as it's done responsibly, as long as it's you know, really well, well written and cautious. Uh, so we're very hopeful. Would these be a first of the kind, you know, in terms of states or any government entities really coming out and legalizing it recreationally themselves without going through a voter approved measure? Well, with the exception of Uruguay, uh, you, but. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's know, a good but, point. Uh, in President terms of in the, in the country, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, beyond medical only, when we talk about adult use, uh, yes, this would be the first time. Uh, and it's very exciting and it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what, what 
lessons Vermont borrows and, and Rhode Island uh, borrow from, from states like Colorado or, or Washington where the, we've seen it happen through an initiative process because ultimately what will happen is you'll see these initiatives pass and then you'll start to see some of these legislatures passing them and then down the road we will start to see the lessons learned from both being combined and you see uh, laws sure. being passed as what we saw with medical marijuana as well. Oh, man. Well, let's skip over to Ohio because, as you know all too well, a flawed recreational initiative there failed in 2015, and now the state will consider a medical marijuana initiative this year, it looks like. Um, so from your opinion, from the Marijuana Policy Project's position, is this moving backwards, or is this perhaps the direction that uh, maybe activists there should have considered last year? Well, it's by all means moving forward because Ohio is a state where you've got 90% of the voters thinking marijuana should be legal for medical purposes and no medical marijuana law, and this will create one. And, uh, you know, ultimately this is a very personal one for me because my whole family's from Ohio. I've oh, got wow. some of older family members who could, quite frankly, benefit from this. And, and so, uh, you know, we think Ohio's ready. There's a lot of energy, a lot of excitement following last year. You know, while there was a lot of arguing over whether marijuana should be legalized, and there was a lot of arguing over whether the proposed system was a good way or not of doing it, no one was really arguing over whether sick and dying people should be allowed to use medical marijuana. That was kind of a given. Right. And so we want to go back and we want to take care of that. We want to get that medical marijuana law passed, take care of those people who need it, and then move on to that broader debate about, about whether marijuana should be legal for adults. Ah, interesting. It it, did it seem uh, to you like they were trying to maybe leapfrog that step? And are we there yet where a massive state like Ohio can leapfrog medical and just go straight wreck? Well, I think one of the big issues was that it was, uh, there's certainly questions about the type of proposal they brought forward and how it was worded. And, sure. Uh, but also there are certainly some issues with uh, the year in which it was run. It was an off-year election, and we know that when these measures appear on the ballot in an off-year election, it's a more conservative, older voter turnout, and it's a lot more difficult to pass something. Now, that doesn't mean it would have passed if they had done the same initiative next year, but it's safe to say that it will do better, any initiative would do better in 2016 with the presidential election turnout than would have last year. Sure. Well, we'll be watching it, and I'm sure we're going to have you on again to talk some more. So thanks for joining yes, us. Yes, anytime. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> now, before we introduce our next guest, I'm going to throw to our very own Doctor of Dank, Professor Pat, for this week's entry in the new Cannabis Lexicon. Flower. Rather than calling them buds, many modern cannabis aficionados refer to the female plant's racemes, that's the official horticulture term, as flowers. When you go into a dispensary, one of the most common first questions is flowers, edibles, or concentrates. Or, for example, many people do nothing but dab, but I like nothing more than a nice flower. Thanks for that, Professor Pat. Now on to our next guest who founded Women Grow, which is one of the largest networking organizations in legal cannabis. So please help me welcome Jane West to The Cannabis Show. Hey, how's it going? Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Great to see you. Uh, yeah. Oh, I brought you our first uh, product that's come to market, the Weekender. You're the first uh, one to get one. The Weekender. Yes. Tell me what's going on here, the um, Weekender. So the Weekender is uh, the new dugout. It's a mobile unit that you can carry several different types of cannabis in for oh. the weekend. It'll be carried at um, Mindful, Medicine Man, and Dank uh, in March. So oh, nice. It's a great way for people coming into town for the weekend to just pick up a couple strains and a nice onesie so they have everything they need and and so people can buy this at shops can they also buy it online they can buy it online yes at janewest.com cool. well, thank yeah. you for that You're i welcome. appreciate it so jane we're asking everybody now sativa or indica oh right now definitely indica oh yeah yes, yes. for similar reasons to mason or <laughs> different or? yeah i think mostly just like staying calm in the evenings building up to our big event i definitely like just like a nice <laughs> indica in fact Mindful has one right now called um, Memory Loss that's oh. particularly helpful to just like clear your mind before bed. So <laughs> These names I they're know. coming up with, I tell you. <laughs> well, you mentioned the big event, mm -hmm. Women Grow's Leadership Summit 2016 coming up uh, February 3rd through 5th. Um, you guys expanded quite a bit yes. this year. Three days, a much larger venue, Ellie Cockins Opera House, which yes. is gorgeous downtown Denver venue. Um, why does legal cannabis need this lady-centric annual gathering? Well, 
There's been such incredible growth of Women Grow nationwide. By March, we'll have 44 chapters. Wow. And a lot of those women want to come together. It's that That's where a lot of the connections are really happening that are helping them build their businesses. Um, in more legal in legal states, we have the experience with running and operating our businesses and expanding those businesses. And so as new markets come on, it's those connections that are crucial as the women grow. Wow. Uh, do you think you might sell out? I mean, the Ellie is, yeah. what, about 2,000, <laughs> 2, 2,500 capacity? Um, yes, yeah, um, 2,400 capacity. Um, I don't know if we'll actually sell out, but um, there's uh, there's well over 1,000 people coming now. Um, we gave out hundreds, over 100 scholarships to the event as well. Um, and we have a lot of, it's really about bringing newcomers um, into our community. Um, so we have some arrangements with SSDP on a national level. We really want to get... Um, that next generation in and get them connected with what we've built here. Ah, cool. That's Students for Sensible Drug yes. Policy, of course. So, um, you know, going back to last year's summit, tell us a story or two <laughs> that kind of, you know, tells us how this group, Women mm -hmm. Grow, and also how this event ends up connecting people who should have known each other. Mm -hmm. So about a year ago, we brought together um, 120 women nationwide that were all leaders in cannabis to Denver, Colorado, to really start that building of that network, get them connected, and also get their input on what is going to be most helpful and most important to them in each mm -hmm. of their states. And bringing them all together, uh, we booked out the Cordier Resort up in the mountains. It was entirely ours uh, for the weekend. I've heard stories. <laughs> I've heard stories. Oh, what what happens in Cordillera stays there. <laughs> but I mean, it was incredible. It was it exceeded all of my expectations. Um, a lot of the women that came there either started businesses or partnerships, or were able to have their services utilized at one of the. Uh, businesses there at the summit. Um, people like, for instance, Heidi Keys, like she's uh, sure. really grown with a lot of her connections with Women Grow, she was able to fairly easily um, replicate her business model, Puff Puff Pass Paint, here in Washington, in Oregon, by simply reaching out to the Women Grow Network there. Oh, that's a good point. We just had Heidi on the show uh, two, three months ago talking mm -hmm. about an issue that I know you both are passionate about public consumption, social yes. use, how this can work. Yes. So, um, Lauren Gibbs also, she was just on the show. Oh yeah, Yeah, of that was the beginning of her meeting um, the Willie's team and it's it's been incredible. Willie Nelson, Willie's Reserve, mm -hmm. just featured on Chelsea Handler's new Netflix show. This yeah. uh, just came out last week, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you also just added a new keynote to the symposium yes. and I wanted to ask you, yes. Melissa Etheridge is yes. coming and she she's speaking coming. on the cannabis paradigm. Yes. So tell us about how she became involved and also what those early mm -hmm. conversations with mm -hmm. her uh, were like. Well, I mean, she's always been such a great advocate for the movement um, and for diversity in general. And her manager came out to our leadership summit a year ago to kind oh, of like cool. check out the group and, you know, see kind of what we're building here. And so it's been a slow building process, but um, she's in New Zealand right now. So um, mm. we weren't sure if we'd be able to get into her schedule, but um, she just confirmed last week that she's coming and we cannot, I can't wait to see her. I saw her briefly at an ArcView conference, but... Um, she has a really important message, and I can't wait to see her on the Opera House stage. She's a passionate activist. I remember when she first started really talking out on this issue, taking almost every opportunity to mm -hmm. you know, talk about the importance mm -hmm. of medical marijuana and, and what it's served in her life. Mm -hmm. um, I want to bring Mason back into the conversation. So psyched to have you guys both on the same show, by the way. Have fun. Um, but you guys are both leaders in Colorado's cannabis community, clearly. And as more states come online, and as some of them figure out various aspects of legal marijuana before Colorado does, maybe it's weed delivery, maybe it's public consumption, social use. Um, do, you, do you guys have any fear that we're going to be left behind in this industry um, that we've been a leader in up until now? Mason, why don't we start with you? Um, you know, I, I don't have s significant fear, so to speak. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, marijuana generally sells itself. I mean, this is a product that, that, that people are going to learn about and, and new <laughs> products will develop and new services and so on. And, and then we will see laws accommodate those. Uh, I do think that there's a question as to whether 
we will take advantage of, of being the first, and that's really up to our officials. That's up to our state and local officials. And while we have some who are very forward thinking, you look at like Pueblo County, for example, sure. uh, the, the county commission down there has really taken steps to embrace this new, uh, this new legal product and to you know, have tax incentives and programs and things out there to, to attract these businesses. Some other Colorado officials, not so much. And that's that's the problem. And you know, where, whereas for example, we see Colorado using our ties to craft brewing to build Colorado's brand and really be known for craft brewing and right. so on, and, and making it a big part of it. Yeah, you know, and California does that for wine country. And you know, are we going to have officials who do that with marijuana? If they were wise, I think they should. But I don't know if they will. It's interesting to see uh, former Colorado tourism chief Al White now starting to work for marijuana businesses less than a couple months after leaving his post there. But yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Jane, what, do you, what, what are your thoughts on this issue? Hmm. I think as we see legalization kind of evolve nationwide, the one thing I always direct people back to is the unlimited licensing model here in Colorado that like really allowed small business owners to throw their hat in the ring and start to develop brands that are huge now here. And so um, I hope people keep looking to Colorado to what we've set in place there. And I'm surprised other states aren't following suit. There's just so much competition to for access to the market. And it's so extremely expensive to even buy to get a license that it's really blocking out groups that don't traditionally have access to capital. Sure. Um, and so I hope that they keep continue to look at what Colorado's been able to grow here and what we've been able to do for small business, which really, I think, is one of the best things about bringing cannabis into your community. It's interesting. I've talked with a couple other journalists um, uh, from California primarily in the last month, and, and they were coming to Colorado for the first time, and their minds were blown. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, we get it. We know medical, but this, walking into a store with our ID, and, and buying marijuana is so new. And at the same time, they couldn't believe that you can't have it delivered. Right. And I'm like, yeah, that's, <laughs> I don't know how far that is off, if it's ever going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, you guys well, have a feeling about delivery? Just, I, mean, I mean, they just started liquor delivery services here. I see sure. billboards all over town of yeah. how you can get liquor Good delivered point. to your home and, and immediately. <laughs> so, I, I mean, yeah, you're going to see different, different, different states uh, trying different things and and learning from each other. I mean, there are still states out there that require you to buy liquor in package stores, and you got to go to, you know, alcohol beverage control, which is run by the state government, just to buy. So you've got your liquor delivery, and then you've got your liquor stores, and then you've got that. I mean, you know, alcohol's been legal for a long time, and we still have this wide array of of ways in which people are handling it and we're going to see the same situation with marijuana. It's uh, a good point. Good point. Um, you guys, it's Jane's favorite part of the show. <laughs> it is the pot quiz. Oh, last time Betty and I were like, I mean, he like the first three questions he asked them and we both were just like who was it? Was it Betty uh, Albert with Betty uh, yeah. students? Yeah. Okay. And they were just idiots. Anyway, so we'll, <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see. Well, better luck this time. Better luck to you both. So, Mason, we're starting with you. And we are going to Sundance with this question. What rapper was quoted as saying, my cause is marijuana, peace, and music, while performing at the Sundance Film Festival this week? Uh... <laughs> I know you've, uh, you're a big hip hop head, I, right? I am, but my, my the extent of my hip hop knowledge and love really ends at around 1998. Um, <laughs> That's that was so, good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that was very good stuff. Uh, so I you know, I know it wasn't Nas. I know it wasn't Biggie. Uh, so uh, kind of at a loss. <laughs> Want to um, throw a guess? Uh, psh, uh, Wiz Khalifa. Very good guess, Mason Tavert for the point. Starting things off strong. Yes. All right, Jane, you're up next. Gracious donors to What AIDS Charity are currently bidding on the opportunity to win experiences that include getting your portrait painted by James Franco or going on a marijuana wellness retreat with Snoop Dogg. What is the name of the AIDS charity that is hosting this fundraiser? And, um, I, and I could say it's an international AIDS charity. I feel comfortable with that. Okay. Um, an international AIDS charity. Um, do you know the answer, Mason? <laughs> hey, 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 hey. No, no communicating. <laughs> no. Um, 
Is it the red group, the group that does the Very red? good. Okay. Yes, okay, good. all right. Okay, good, you good, guys good. are uh, okay, on point with your guesses today. Keep okay. them coming. Mason, the Denver Broncos and Carolina Panthers will meet in Super Bowl 50 um, in what 420 heritage city? San Francisco or Santa Clara. Very well done. Either one would have worked. Both are accurate. Uh, by the way, you guys think we stand a chance? I'm a Cardinals fan, so I don't really want to talk about it. Oh, man. I'm from Arizona, so. That was painful. At I'm sorry. At least I have a good, long, you know, 32 years of experiencing loss <laughs> with the Cardinals, so. Not, yeah. All right, last question. You guys are killing it. Are we going to have a tie? Do we even have a tiebreaker question lined up? Of course Jane. we don't. Don't, don't show our cards. <laughs> Jane, Oregon is considering a standardized dose of edible marijuana at how many milligrams according to the Oregon Health Authority? As you both know, our standardized dose in Colorado, mm -hmm. 10 milligrams. Five? Whoa! It's our first tie on the Cannabis Show. That's pretty bananas. We're going to arm wrestle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We're going to arm wrestle this out. I say we just go with the tie. You guys are both yeah, winners. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally. happy with the tie. Well done. You guys came more prepared this time nice. than our average guests. Um, I do want to say thank you to our guests, Mason Tavert and Jane West. Thanks to you all for watching and listening. I'm Ricardo Baca. I'm joined by all of our producers, Vince, Dane, Eric. Have a great day, everyone and we will see you next week. Show the sound of truth. I'm allowed to lose it well to the win. I'm all in, I'm going in any pot so you'll be raising at the end. I'll say it again. Ain't afraid to get in. I'll be going for the jackpot with aces in my hand. I'm raw.